to showcase celebrating technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Monica Recalo, for the ones that were here earlier, and I will be in charge of introducing the speaker for, his, for this breakout session. This session is being recorded, and the presenters will let you know whether you will be able to address your questions at any time during the presentation or after the presentation has an essay. Um, this uh, session doesn't have trans translation um, service, so this presentation will be uh, in English, fully. Um, we will appreciate that you change your mobile uh, phone to vibration or silent mode in order to have full attention to, th to this session. Finally, we will distribute the evaluation form that I uh, please make sure to complete it before the, se the session is over and hand it in back to me. Um, now we're ready to start. The presenter for, for this session is Hamadi Herdenson, and the title, the title of the presentation is An Intervention to Increase the Vocabulary Acquisition of English Language Learners at Community College um, yeah, and you are the doctoral candidate for Cooney Graduate Center. Okay, now you can start. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, so, as she um, said earlier, had that lovely introduction, um, I'll be talking about a study um, that is currently on, that's on um, right now that uh, focuses on increasing the vocabulary acquisition of English language learners. Um, and I'll give you more details about the student population and the, reason, the rationale behind this study. Just a little overview of what I actually just turned out. Um, so just a little overview of what I plan on talking about. Um, just give you guys some background um, about the topic. Um, you know, what's the purpose of this research? Why uh, we should bother with this? Um, and then I'll connect that to um, the usage of multimedia and um, language learning, um, particularly this uh, application called Duolingo, which we'll talk about in a bit of detail. Um, and then I'll go over the study design regarding the research sample, the you know, students, the school, that sort of thing, variables, and then the procedure. And then also we'll have time, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit, but I'd like to hear a lot of feedback um, from all of you about like, what are some next steps, what do you think are some possible um, regarding this study. Okay. So the first thing, we're just going to start this off with a table. Um, this table comes from the 2012 um, census, census data. Um, and this was a survey of foreign-born foreign -born American citizens. Um, and if you look at this number, they were asking the um, they were asking these people how much English do you speak? And you can see the answers on the side. Is this? Can you guys see this? You can see. Okay, so I'll explain everything. Um, so they asked um, the foreign-born um, citizens, you know, how much English do you speak at home if at all? Um, and so you have out of an estimated population of 40,000, 40 plus thousand. Um, you had about 15% saying that they only speak English at home. Um, the remaining individuals say that they speak um, another language, their primary language, but they speak English very well. And then the remaining 15%, so if you add up these last three, or yes, these last three uh, groups, you have about 50% indicating that they speak English less than very well. So that's either they think that they're they speak it well, it's okay, uh, not well, or not at all. Um, and so I like that little box right here. So these are the actual numbers, these are the percentages over here. Um, just give me color. So this, this graph here is actually taking that data from the previous table about um, the usage of English among the foreign born population in America um, and breaking it down by the re their region of origin. So if you look at it just regardless of the region, you see that it was 50 said that they speak English very well, and then 50% um, indicated that they speak English less than very well. Um, but then if we go to regions, uh, so we'll skip that one for right now. But if 
to look at Africa, so individuals with uh, their homeland is Africa. 70% you know, of them indicate that they can speak English very well, or they speak at home. Um, Europe, more or less the same thing. When we get to Asia, then we start to see you know, the two bars are a little closer to each other. So the proficiency in English among the Asian um, population in America is not as strong as the other um, groups. And then finally, when we look at the Latin American and Caribbean population, we can see that um, the proficiency in the English or the usage of English um, outside of the formal setting um, is not as uh, prevalent as the other groups. Um, and so, in and of itself, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, not everyone needs to speak English, but it all, the issue comes into play when we talk about education. Um, one of the issues that's very typical um, for ELL students is that they don't often have the right supports in these schools um, to support them in understanding the material, learning languages, or learning English, um, understanding things like mathematics because of their language background. So typically, um, you have very few counselors, very, school, very few school psychologists who are available to support these students. And the ones who are there are often very poorly trained and cannot, they're not very effective at supporting these students with their um, academic needs. So, and just going further um, with this issue, this graph is a little anticlimactic. I wanted to make it pop, uh, but I couldn't get it to work that way. But um, essentially, this is the data for our uh, fourth grade reading, um, reading assessments. And you can see this bottom line graph represents the English language learner students. So this is at the fourth grade uh, level. And you can see throughout the years, their progression from 1998 to 2015, um, the average uh, score and reading assessment. When you compare that to the non-ELL students, you can kind of see that there's this pervasive gap separating the two um, populations, uh, which is indicative of some sort of deficit um, that can impair their academic performance in the long run. And you may be thinking that, oh, well, this is just fourth grade, so you know things will probably brighten up later on. No, they won't. Um, basically, at the eighth grade level, the same, basically collecting the same data, uh, you see that there's still just this consistent, pervasive gap separating um, non-ELL students and ELL students. multimedia, uh, the, the word multimedia means using multiple 
ways of displaying multiple mediums of expressing information. And so the idea here is that uh, for ELL students, they benefit a lot and they actually prefer the usage of pictures and text and audio. Um, and I'm just curious, are there any uh, educational psychologists or educational theorists in the room right now? Anybody? Because I was just curious as to whether or not anyone could guess or figure out what theory these three items um, are connected to. Any chance is anyone? Maybe not. Okay, that's fine. Good um, luck. So this is uh, related to Pavio's uh, dual coding theory. Um, it's the idea that having these multiple models or multiple uh, means of presentation using multimedia um, allows for your brain to use multiple pathways to encode information. And so because you're using these multiple pathways, um, it's easier for you to retrieve the information later on. So for example, um, if you incorporate a vocabulary word using the word that you hear and then also a picture of what it um, displays, um, you don't have to hear the word again. You can also see the item and that will retrieve, that will allow you to retrieve from your memory. So it facilitates the process. So now that we talked about um, multimedia, and I provided some information as to why multimedia could be beneficial in using, uh, beneficial to um, language learning and uh, vocabulary learning in particular. I want to talk about the specific um, tool that I'm referring to in this study. So, um, is anyone familiar with Duolingo? Okay. Are you using it right now? I see my students use it. Okay. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> you, we're, and everyone here is going to find out how great it is right now. Um, so some basic information about Duolingo. Um, it's a free language learning app, or actually it's a website that has an, a corresponding app. Um, you can use it on your desktop and also use it on your mobile devices. Um, it includes this thing called crowdsource text translation, um, which I'll show you a, in a video, but basically it has people who are learning a new language translate documents from that uh, language. So if you are studying Spanish, you know, you have the opportunity to look at documents in Spanish, uh, Wikipedia documents in Spanish, and translate them based on what you learn. And um, other people who are either learning Spanish or people who know Spanish, who speak Spanish fluently, can actually uh, grade or evaluate your translations. And based, uh, based on this like, back and forth uh, interaction, that's how you come up with the full translation that is used on Wikipedia. Um, it also includes this language profic proficiency assessment center. Um, this is they actually allow for um, individuals to get uh, certification um, in foreign languages through this app. So, and um, a previous evaluation with this uh, app showed that the um, about 34 hours of usage, an average of 34 hours of usage usage was equivalent to like one semester of a language course. So you know, instead of taking an expensive language course, you can just take, you know, use this phone app for 34 hours, and that's supposed to be more or less the equivalent. So I'm gonna show you some videos, just to, for those of you who have not seen this, I just wanna show you some videos that we will.
So basically, um, you can see here, uh, this is the interface that you can see once you log into your Google account. Um, and you can see these are a bunch of lessons. Um, here are some quick basics, phrases, things like that. Um, so you can see that, so I'm clicking, uh, I clicked on the basics, and I already did this lesson, so I'm just going to click YouTube, but normally it would be brand new for you if you are doing this for your first time. You see, they're showing the pictures of an item, and they're actually going to translate um, the boy, or still have the boy. And um, one thing that you can't hear this is that uh, it actually says the word for you, so you can actually incorporate the pronunciation um, of, half of this word and uh, internalize that as well. Um, one thing that's uh, different about the mobile, or the mobile version is that um, it has you actually speak into your phone to um, say, the word. Yeah, say, yeah, say the word, exactly. Um, and it checks your pronunciation. Okay, so here again, like I have to actually type in English um, word. And notice how when I hover over the words, it shows me every meaning of the word. Um, or every translation. Those are known as glosses. So I actually spelled it wrong without putting the AC. Yeah, okay, yeah, I didn't put that in um, And so you notice that there's a progress bar at the top. If you don't get the answer right, you don't get um, you don't get to move forward. Um, and you can see these are the students. Um, and you 
can see the green, the yellow, and the red box. It shows you the completed, the late, and the missed assignments. And I'll show you about, I'll show you um, the assignments in a second. But as you can see, when you click on a student, you get the details about um, the student's performance and everything. And looking at the activity log, you can actually see how many times or how long a student has logged into the system. So assignments, you can create your assignments using the lessons that are available in Duolingo. Um, next, you can also uh, build your own curriculum or build your own curriculum based on the skills necessary for learning a language. So here, um, we're looking at English for Spanish speakers. I um, mean, you can see here they have modules that should be put together to match yourself to create lessons. Um, and then class activities. Um, these are things like practicing and flashcards that you can create to support your students in their language learning journey. Okay, so now that I've shown you all of that, I want to talk about the study that I uh, created using this. Um, so. My research sample um, is 46 students um, enrolled in basic English course uh, 226. Um, this is, these students are uh, ESL learners or ELL learners um, at Queensborough Community College. Um, this is a school, um, this is a school located in Queens, uh, this west part of Queens, um, that is, has a very large um, immigrant population, particularly um, ELL students. Um, and so the, I thought that they were ideal for this uh, study. The average age of the participants was 21. Um, there were 24 females, so there were females uh, were male. Um, and the most common native languages in this sample uh, was uh, Mandarin Chinese, which was 22 participants, and then Spanish was 14 participants. Um, and then the average uh, years of formal English education uh, was 2.5. So, um, looking at the study itself, um, the procedure, um, well, the study it was a pre-post within subjects design. So, um, all of the students received the treatment. Um, they received, uh, basically, I tried to see if this uh, act actually improves their vocabulary acquisition. So, formative right. assessment. Pardon? That's your formative assessment. Yeah, exactly. So, um, starting, so first I had the students complete a diagnostic questionnaire which asks questions about um, you know, your gender, your age, your native language. Um, and then secondly, I had them complete the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test um, version four. Is um, everyone familiar with that? Anyone familiar with that? I will show you an example of that right now. So basically this is a test to assess someone um, vocabulary knowledge and um, basic intelligence. And so this test is administered with an easel. You have this book that displays something like this. And you would say to a participant, okay, point to the picture of laughing. Um, because I hope all of you know which picture that is. Um, and, in that, and in that case, that, was, that is what you will use to assess whether or not the student or the individual um, has a strong enough vocabulary. In fact, that's actually an excessive amount of school. Well, I wouldn't say excessive, but it's 
quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was hoping to push them for the higher, um, higher setting so that I would have a distribution of participation because that's one of the variables that we'll be looking at. Um, and so for me, I monitor their participation through the Duolingo site that I showed you earlier. Um, and then finally, to see if there was a change or to gauge any change, they, I had them complete the Peabody Creation Vocabulary Test B version. So there's an A and B version, and it's basically parallel tests that allow you to um, do a pre and post um, analysis. So I think the saddest part about this, though, is. Um, sorry. Oh, wait, no, not yet. Talking about the variables really quickly. Um, so the independent variables, I was looking at what is it, their native language, um, their course midterm exam score. And the reason why I was looking at that is not just the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test Score. Um, is because I wanted to see if Duolingo can be um, incorporated into their classes, into their uh, the school's curriculum. And so for it to be meaningful, or, for it to have any value, it also has to improve their performance in the school-based exams on top of some random external uh, standardized exam. So that was one of the uh, independent variables of the targets. Of course, the Peabody Picture Vocabulary uh, Test Score, um, and then the amount of usage of Duolingo that which is measured in hours. Um, and then the dependent, the dependent variables were their final Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test Score and their course final exam score which once again, I want to see if it was practical, uh, if the usage of uh, Duolingo had a practical um, improvement uh, in their classes. And so basically the model is that all these independent variables were regressed on both of these dependent variables. Um, but so the sad part is that this study, or the data collection, was not completed in time for this presentation, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So I can't tell you, I can't make any suggestions to any of you. Um, about uh, supporting uh, English language learners in your classroom. But I do want to talk a little bit about some, and I, I would love to have your input on this, on just some things that I have, I'm currently thinking about regarding this study, and uh, yeah, I just want to hear your input. So um, just thinking about um, the differentiated impact of different languages and using this app. So for example, Spanish and Chinese, which were the main um, languages of my student population that were in the study, they're very different. Um, and if you're trying to if you're trying to learn English from one of those languages, you're probably going to have a very different experience. So Spanish uses the Latin alphabet, which English also uses, and Chinese does not. It uses it has a completely different you know, calligraphy to it. So um, there can be a differentiated impact of what's the native language. Um, how does that impact the efficacy of using this um, app in language learning? Um, also, there's the potential, I mean, just going off of that, there's the potential of um, a culture-language interaction where um, language is inherently linked to culture. So if a student comes from a culture that maybe doesn't look favorably on learning things through a computer, um, that student may not do very well using this app, that sort of thing. Um, and so taking that into consideration, you know, what is what is the impact of culture or the the, uh, what's the, word? the interaction between culture and language on the usage of this app and improvement um, of your language or your uh, vocabulary using this application. So that is all I have for guys. I just want to hear some questions or comments or concerns or anything. Um, and not it, it 
not have an effect or impact their coursework. So um, during the class, during the, typically during his class, there are periods where the students have opportunities to search the net for documents or things that will help them with their language learning. And so he would allow students to dedicate time um, to using that application. Um, yeah, during class time. Um, and it, um, it doesn't really, that doesn't violate the nature of the study simply because the students were already surfing the net during that time anyway, so now they had the opportunity to do that, participate in the study without it, you know, adding on to their work. Um, and did you find that the learning It covered a lot more um, material um, than the course that they were in. So the students in this, these, uh, this basic English course, they're not all coming from the same language background. So they can't get individualized um, support um, learning English from their native language, which is something that Duolingo can um, give them. So yeah, it, it was able to cover more of the material than uh, they had access to. Yes? So you can actually use the Duolingo and monitor the amount of hours that they spend you can monitor the, the number of hours that they spend. You can also see um, how successful they were in completing um, their uh, modules or their learning modules. Um, and you can use that to um, design course material in your classroom. Or you can also use that to design course material on Duolingo uh, to support them. Can you provide feedback to, to each student through it? No, that, that is one thing I wasn't able to. I didn't see anything like that. I'm not sure if they were currently working on something like that, but I, that would be. So you don't get to, I'm sorry, you don't get to personally interact, so you don't get to see the development of the person. No, no, you, you can see, you can see what, yeah, yeah, I can see what they are doing and their scores and that sort of thing, but uh, with regards to like, can I send them a note, I can't do that. So it's just empirical, you're, you're just getting the data. Together. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. Do you think you would add a follow-up component to this if you were to continue to follow that since that is a missing element there? Yeah, absolutely. So the thing is, is that um, when I look at um, using Duolingo for language learning, it's not a panacea. I don't see it as a replacement for course uh, coursework material. It's basically just a supplement that's supposed to facilitate um, supporting students and giving them more training um, outside of the classroom. So that would be a component that would be a part of the class um, uh, and not necessarily uh, in the system. But I there's still potential pitfalls to the to the program itself because I know the students. The main uh, one of the main issues that I heard from, from the students, um, I had one that was she was doing the Dutch one, okay. and she had said that uh, she gets far, but then after a while they become disengaged from yes. the tool. So they start off very strong and they're not using the thing 24 seven, and then they just because it gets kind of like redundant. And yes, so, exactly. So I don't know how you would. Um, Unless it was a mandatory part in the syllabus, the hours that you're gonna, you know, require students to do, yeah, like students lose interest fast. You all know this. Students lose mm -hmm. interest fast. Mm -hmm. it's like, ten seconds. Yeah, that's that's it. Well, that's exactly what I expect to happen. Right. Yeah, given, telling them to do it for five hours, I didn't expect any of them to do it for five hours. I was quite certain that I would say distribution right. um, of participation, um, and you can almost see like the students who are the most motivated are the ones who would probably go for three hours or right. four. That, I believe you're right, you know, it, it makes a difference, the language that's being spoken in the predominant language. You know, you want from symbols to letters. Yes. Of course, there's going to be a difference mm -hmm. in the way you see things and the connotation and the denotation of the stuff you're hearing, of course. So, very interesting. Anything else? I would love to see the, the, the difference between male and female. That, you know, that is, um, I'm not entirely sure I mean that is a that is a variable to look into. I I, I wasn't um, able to I couldn't come up with a theoretical basis for why that would be different. I can help you with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that and uh, left handed versus right handed. I'm sorry, I gotta go there. Okay. Because you know that there's a difference, right? What do you mean with regards to your handwriting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so, like with regards to brain patterns and how your neurotransmitters work and how your brain actually processes and collects information and gathers it has a lot to do with the way you see the way you see language, written, verbiage, the way you see it and, and your 
predominant style or your predominant head. Wouldn't that be cool? Mm -hmm. uh, see, I, I see, so I haven't seen a lot of research that indicated that there was a huge difference between left-handed and right-handed individuals. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I mean, you can tell. No, no, there's, 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 there's significant research. So, you know, the left-handed brain tends to be, um, people that are left-handed tend to be, you know, tend to be more artistic and more, um, you know, because the corpus colossal, even the way their brain is shaped is completely different. So that would mean that a person who, who had that creativity aspect and had that, you know, that interchange, that neuronal interchange would particularly learn a language faster than another person. You know, because then you ask yourself the question of, well, these two people got the same exact class, same exact duolingo hours, same language, one learned it faster than the other. Why? So then you look at those variables, you know, yeah. which is, I don't know, it's pretty No, but I, th I think the biggest issue with um, this, and I see this a lot in all, all psychological research regarding right handed and left handedness, is that since left right handedness is so much more prevalent, it's very hard to get a sample size that's large enough right, for, for a statistical okay. um, significance. So, yeah. Cool. Wouldn't that be cool? Yes, it would be. Kind of I mean, you want, to, you want to know as much as you possibly can right. about. Yeah. I think you're up to something new, too. You got an hour. How long have you got left in the program? Oh, uh, I have about uh, six months. Oh. oh, for this study. For this study. Mm -hmm. So. You still have time to collect that information oh, yeah. that yeah. she's suggesting? Yeah, I have. Well, with I mean, regards to the left hand, that's probably not, but uh, maybe gender, I can definitely add that in. Mm -hmm. yes. But how how long in your program for program termination? Oh, for, for me to like graduate? Yes. Oh, I have, well, what, two years? No, two and a half years. We got time. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Just say yes. You so can always say yes. <laughs>